Well, of course, you don't need a, a rose, Gail, to, <laughs> to look as beautiful as you do without the rose. Okay. But, but, but thank you for those kind comments. And thank you, Terry, um, for uh, welcoming us here again to the library. Um, and of course, ev every time we have a little book display um, of books relevant to the topic, check out the sonnet, uh, the sonnet books um, just down there. If you want to check them out, the library be a good way of following up today's uh, talk. Well, today's speaker, the last uh, in this spring series, um, Mike Schoenfield, is chair of the English department here at Vanderbilt and a much published author. He's an outstanding teacher, uh, and I'm delighted that he could join us here at what's a very busy time of year for, for chairs, trying to wrap up the semester. Let me give you just a brief glimpse of his academic accomplishments. He has a PhD and an MPW in fiction, that must be a master's in something like some kind of writing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> poetic writing? Uh, okay. Um, and this is from the University of, of Southern California. His main areas of research are 19th century British periodical and legal culture, romanticism, print culture, literature, and law. He's the author of The Professional Wordsworth, Law, Literature, and the Poet's Contract, and British Periodicals and Romantic Identity, The Literary Lower Empire. And that was just a couple of years ago. In 2005, he won our Jeffrey Nordhaus Award for Outstanding Teaching, and his book on Romantic Identity won the Colby Prize for Outstanding Work on 19th Century Periodicals. And just to show you what a multi-talented Fellow Professor Schoenfield is, I would add that the three grade book logic books he co-authored some while back, Playing with Logic, Discovering Logic, and Adventures with the Logic, had now sold almost half a million copies. So your children may have already been educated um, by Mark. Now you may wonder why I've asked Mark, an expert on poetry, to talk to us today when the headlines are filled with apparently much more important dramatic world events. Well, leaving aside the themes of love and, and death, which provide the focus for his talk, which could hardly, I mean, these themes could hardly be of greater interest to all of us. I would also remind you of the works of, the words of my countryman, the poet Shelley, that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Soft power, you might say. But would the likes of Obama and Osama really care? Well, if you look on the web, you can find their poetry, too. Both, I mean, unbelievable. They've both written poems, and they're out there on the web. With Osama bewailing the demise of the seventh century caliphate. <laughs> so and it's not, it's all connected. Perhaps Shelley was right. And then, of course, there's, you know, Bob Dylan and people from my generation. But I don't want to stand between you and our speaker any further. One of his students writes that Mark, and I quote, pushes discussions about poetry to levels you never knew existed. Well, please welcome Mark Schoenfeld. <laughs> Well, if I'd known about the roses, I would have picked sonnets to talk about roses. <laughs> um, but um, thank you all for being here. Um, thanks to David um, for that introduction and for proposing this. Um, thanks to the library for supporting it. Um, sonnets um, are deeply traditional poetic form in English. And so today, we're going to sort of look a little bit at um, what that tradition is and how more recent poets give a bit of a spin on it. Um, and my idea is to try to convince you that although the first two terms of my subtitle, love and death, um, seem the much more significant one, the third of those form is um, equally interesting. Um, that is to say, how something is said is as important and as delightful um, as what it is that is said. Um, and that ultimately the how it's said and the what, is, what it is that's said are intertwined. 
Um, put another way, form amplifies the meaning. Um, so I'm going to start just sort of laying out a little bit of what a sonnet is. Um, what is a sonnet? Um, this particular definition comes from Rossetti, um, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who we're going to look at um, a little bit later in, in full, but this is um, a sonnet is a moment's monument, memorial from the soul's eternity to one dead, deathless hour. And what he's talking about here is that a sonnet sort of is made up thematically of two parts. One, there's always a definite situation, that moment that's being recounted, being enacted. Um, and against that, there's generally a larger claim about the human condition whether about love, um, death, l lots of other, you know, the, the state of the world. Um, and the, the, what the sonneteer is trying to do is put those two together um, in ways that sometimes are very serious and other times are playful and ironic. And we're going to sort of look at some of the sort of techniques that are used for getting those two things to come together. Um, and the techniques come out of, for sonnets, more or less a set of rules um, that can be adhered to, can also be bent, and once in a while even broken. Um, so I want to start by looking at a sonnet that's probably familiar to many of you. Um, and what I'm going to do every time I put it, we're, we're only going to get through, through a few sonnets. Normally when I teach a class, in, a, in 50 minutes I get through one sonnet. Um, so we're going to try to get through four or so. Um, but I want to begin with one that I think will be familiar to many of you. Um, and I'm, in each case I'm going to read the sonnet first just so we have a little bit of a sense of what's going on with it before I sort of move into the form of it. So this is Sonnet 116 by Shakespeare. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters where it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Loves not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ nor no man ever loved. And so, I mean, you can see sort of what the main claim is, and um, many of you may have been at weddings where this poem um, gets read. Um, and you'll see in this reading that that will become a little bit ironic. Um, because, of course, the main claim is that love is this unbending thing that lasts forever. But the actual situation of the poem, that is what the speaker is doing, um, is is he's basically accusing the person he's addressing of absolutely having bent, right? He's saying um, that the, the addressee, right, has not been true. Um, and so you get the addressee is, who is never mentioned, right, but is only sort of squeezed between the let me that begins this and so really the hidden context, right? Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments, even if you do. Um, and then the end of it, right, if this be error and upon me proved, well, yeah, it's already been proved upon you because you've been unfaithful. So the this situation of the poem is really argumentative. Um, and, I, and so the way the um, poem structures it, it, is structured is as a kind of series of competitions or battles. And I just want to sort of just point out a couple just to <laughs> get a little bit at the structure. So we get here. This will work better than my fingers, I think. Right, the ever, the ever fixed mark and the tempest, right? The ever fixed mark being a star that's always in the same place. And these two are sort of fighting for control of the wandering bark in this metaphor, where the boat is kind of the image of, of love or lovers or whatever. Um, or again, um, this line, time's not love's fool. And so there's a battle between love and time as to who's going to win. Um, basically a battle for the hearts and minds of the human condition. Um, so, okay, so that's the sort of general setup of this poem and I want to just use that to get into some of the sort of basic features of, uh, of a sonnet. Um, 
So most obviously um, of a sonnet, sonnets come in 14 lines. That's just the basic unit. One of the interesting things about that is if you have eyesight like I used to have, you could tell a sonnet from about 10 feet away because it, 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 it has a certain block that way. And in fact, you can even um, kind of read it when you get really good at them. As you're reading across, you can also read down and have kind of a sense of what the rhymes are as you go because they're small enough. Um, then next, um, they have a specific rhythm. Um, and that rhythm's called iambic pentameter. That's gonna be the only technical term you hear from me today, so let me just take a moment to, to explain it. It's not very technical. Um, pentameter, just fi five line, five feet. Um, and a foot in poetry just means a combination of accented or unaccented um, syllables. So in this case, an I iambic is unaccented followed by an accent. So here's, just to take this line, right? I'm gonna read this really, overdoing the iambic. Um, loves not times fool, the rosy lips and cheeks. Of course, if you kept reading the poem that way, you, your head would explode. Um, <laughs> but the point about it is, even if you read it conversationally, the kind of feeling of that iambic gives a kind of emphasis and tension. So uh, the way I read it when I read it to you first, right? Loves not times fool, right, where we might you know, one could read it the other way, love's not time's fool, which is how it usually gets read when you are thinking of this as a sweet poem. But it, the tension of it is, the, 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 you know, love's not time's fool. I'm making that claim that it's not because you've just said that it is. Um, so the iambic pentameter does a kind of neat um, work in terms of structuring. Then the next, um, oh, did I press that right? We went too far. Okay, the next really obvious um, feature is of course rhymes. Um, sonnets mostly rhyme. Um, and here's just an easy one. It's a little bit off here, but you can see mark and bark, shaken and taken are just exact rhymes. And the way sonnets use these rhymes is usually to indicate the different sections of it. So the first four lines will often rhyme, then the next four and then the next four, and then the last couplet. So that will divide the sonnet into groups of four, 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 and two. Um, we'll see some other ones that divide it into eight and six, but what that allows is for different sections to sort of argue with or speak to each other or develop from one another, and we'll look at some of those as we go. Um, also, rhymes are things poets just like to be clever with, um, and we'll look at that. Um, Next, um, just grammatical, um, logical, and different linguistic indicators of sections. So here, um, at the end, after our first four lines, we get an intensifier here of, oh no. That doesn't actually add anything to the meaning. It adds to the sort of effective force, because oh no here really just means I'm continuing on and feeling more intense about it. Um, in other, um, linguistic or logical connector is this if this, right? Which says, okay, we've now s gone through all of this and now I'm going to reach a conclusion if this is. Um, and then the last um, sort of feature is just metaphors, puns, linguistic plays. Poets um, are very interested in the sort of multi-meanings that words have. So just a simple one here. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Um, ad admit here, in one sense it means I'm not going to allow any impediments into this marriage, right? So that's, you know, I'm, I'm going to res resolutely insist on this. But it also means within this argument, I'm not going to concede that I'm not even going to allow myself to think about it. No matter how many impediments I see before me, I won't admit that they're there. So there's a kind of d double meaning in that. And then a more playful double meaning that comes into this. Um, that most of you, most of you um, may, may have even sort of noticed with the altars, right? Love is not love which alters weird alteration finds. Love alters not with brief hours and weeks, but till death do us part. That's, of course, my own um, reinterpretation of the line that comes after it. Um, but to, to sort of highlight the pun on love alters and alter as the, the marriage altar, which is a sort of running metaphor through this. Okay. Um, so, basically, very quickly, right, these are the key components we'll be looking at. 14 lines, 
the iambic pentameter, that is that meter of the five unaccented, unaccented followed by an accented syllable, a definite rhyme scheme, um, grammatical, illogical, linguistic indicators, and then metaphors, puns, um, and a certain degree of linguistic playfulness. Um, so we're gonna jump ahead about 200 years um, to the Romantic period. Um, this is a poem by Keats. He, he seems to have written it in a letter. So the guess is he wrote, he dashed this thing off in about 20 minutes. You know, it takes me four hours to talk about it. He wrote it in 20 minutes. <laughs> when I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high-piled books in character hold like rich gardeners the full ripened grain. When I behold upon the night starred face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance and feel that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance. And when I feel, fair creature of an hour, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love, then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone and think to love and fame to nothingness do sink. So I have a little cartoon to sort of art suggest what this is about. <laughs> and this is one of my favorite cartoons in The New Yorker. It's been on my, my, on my refrigerator for about 20 years since my MFA days. Um, the, the poem's about a kind of writer's block at the moment, right? He's having these fears and how it's like tensing him up. Um, and that's his situation. And, then what he's trying to avoid is the next step in that situation. Um, he, Keats does not want to own a fish store. Um, so that's a quick, this is what this poem is about. Of course, a lot more is going on in it. And we could talk about a lot of different aspects of it, but what I want to kind of focus on is the rhymes here, which are, um, and I'm going to just use this coding here, and I'll just explain it real quickly. The, these indicate the rhyme, so B here um, is the first rhyme, so it's just it's labeled A. Um, and I, I noticed when I was rehearsing this that having B as A and B, it, it gets a little bit mixed up. But, so the first rhyme there, and of course it's gonna rhyme to character, so you'll see character here is A also. Brain is a new rhyme, right? None of the rhymes before it, so it gets to be a B. So, and then brain will rhyme to grain, so grain is going to be a B. So the basic rhyme scheme, if we just follow through, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F. Um, and that looks all straightforward enough. But there's actually something more interesting going on in with these rhymes that I want to sort of focus on. And, uh, and that's precisely the way all these rhymes up to line 12, so the first part, until we get to the, the end of that, all of them are the open sounds, right? There's no hard sounds. Brain, character, face, romance. And even more than that, when you look at it, Right, face and romance don't rhyme, but their vowel sounds echo. Right, the N sound of romance uh, there and grain there do. And so the effect of this is, and then we can go down here to hour and more, right? And those, especially the way Keats would have pronounced them would be nearly um, perfect rhyme. So it's, although hour rhymes to power, it almost rhymes to more. So what you get in all of this is kind of the rhyme sounds keep sort of drawing all these poems, all, all these lines of the poems to get the poem together. Um, and in a sense, what that's doing is showing how these different anxieties, the first one that he has in the first four, right, the anxiety about, is he going to be able to write? And this is a very complicated way of putting it. My, before my pen has gleamed my teeming brain, right, his image of, he's got all these thoughts in his brain and somehow his pen is going to put them in order. Um, and then he's going to end up getting them um, in books published, that it, right? And so that, and then somehow as the rhymes describe the poem along, he ends up also equally worrying about his love life. And that is when I feel fair creature of an hour. Um, and the word I want to sort of pause on here is the one that comes sort of right in the middle of this romance, which I've just sort of argued, almost rhymes to grain, it echoes with face, and it's a word that puns, right? What does it mean? Does it mean his romantic writing, 
that he does, right? Um, and Keats was famous for his writing romances. Um, or does it mean his actual love life? And that kind of argument here is they're indistinguishable to him. He writes his life um, as much as he lives his life. Um, but that cr produces for him a great deal of anxiety. Um, and so then what happens, and this where the rhymes change here is at the end of this, he has a, a sort of method how to get out of his writer's block. Right? What's causing it is this fear about love and, and, and fame. And so he stops, right, on unreflecting, then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone and think to love and fame to nothingness do sink. And what I want to point out is that big change in the rhyme. So where before there were those open sounds, these think and sink both end with these sort of click sounds. And it's as if he's taken control of it, as if the, same, the kind of soft sounds of these rhymes have given way to this potency of think. Um, and then there's another way in which that gets echoed. If you'll notice, think here is, it's really the only verb. It's the only thing that happens in this poem. It's something that, an, an actual action he takes. Whereas up here, his brain is totally passive. It's something that his pen is going to glean. Um, and so he's moved from his passive brain to a brain that's sort of taking control of himself. Um, I want to um, just, um, so just to sort of point this out, right? So you get each of the sections here. And on one hand, we had the rhymes. But on the other hand, we get them structured on the other side of it with these whens, right? So when I have fears, when I behold, when I feel. So each of these are different sort of moments, but they build on one another. Um, and again, that's a sort of typical um, um, sonnet structure. But then what he does, what you'd expect is he, he'd sort of finish this last when with this line and then start something new here. But instead, he sort of interrupts his own poem, right? Never have relish of fairy power of unreflecting love. Then right in the middle of the, then on the shore. And it's as if he's taking control actually away from his own poem. He's saying, I'm not going to get hung up on love and fame because you know, one of two things is going to happen. Either love and fame is going to sink to nothingness, or I'm going to. And he chooses love and fame. This is another, and I'm just going to sort of move on. That we're, um, th this is by um, DG, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, the person whose definition of the sonnet we used. Um, and this is a poem, I'll just give a tiny bit of context, um, that he writes um, after his wife's death. And it's called Without Her. What of her glass without her? The blank gray that they, there where the pool is blind of the moon's face. Her dress without her. The tossed empty space of cloud rack whence the moon has passed away. Her paths without her. Day's appointed sway usurped by desolate night. Her pillowed place without her. Tears, ah me, for love's good grace and cold forgetfulness of night or day. What of the heart without her? Nay, poor heart. Of thee, what word remains ere speech be still? A wayfarer by barren ways and chill steep ways and weary without her thou art where the long cloud the long woods counterpart sheds doubled up darkness up the laboring hill that last line is actually really hard to say um, so now i want to just sort of talk a little bit i mean it's quite obvious what the theme of this is in the sense that he, uh, of lamenting and grieving grieving and what I, what I want to talk a little bit about is sort of how he gets this effect. Um, and, this, and in this case, I want to focus on meter a little bit, which is, and it's a really unusual poem because the main subject of this poem, seemingly the her who's missing, right? You can see how often her shows up. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, I missed that one in, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, you know. Um, and then it goes on down here. Um, not, in, in a, n not in a single case is that word accented. It always keeps disappearing. So 
you know, and the key one is without her, right? And so as you say that naturally, the her almost just becomes an exhalation, a giving away without her. Um, and then against that, right, so her presence is dissolving. Against that, you have these really powerful images of her absence, blank gray, moon's face, tossed empty space of cloud rack. That's a great image. I, I don't know if you can quite visualize it, but, but the, her dress is the same. It's as if there's a cloud and the moon was, uh, the moon was behind it, so it looked like the, dress, the cloud was the dress. And now the moon has gone on, and all you have is this sort of dark cloud. Um, and it, 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 it's, it's a really striking image. And again, it's, it's the images of the, the absence that overpower his, there's no recollection of her actually in this. Right, she just keeps fading away, at least for the first, the, the octet, that is those first eight um, lines. But then um, what happens in the last part gets to be, to me, in terms of the language, really interesting, which is the introduction of this word heart. And notice it's a big change, right? Here we've had her glass, her dress, her paths. That's what the questions have been about. And if you just notice these words, glass, dress, paths, they don't rhyme exactly, but they have sound echoes, right? So the S of dress and glass, paths, which actually the TH would be really soft, so that would almost sound like that, and the A sound. So it's, it's almost as if they create a unity. But then he breaks and then asks, what of the heart without her? And the heart, that's to say his heart. And what I want to suggest is what he's doing with sound here is he's absor absorbing the very word her into the word heart. So just as you get her right caught between these two hearts here, and you can see they're, they're very similar words, right? They contain all the same letters. And even in sound, if you just make the T a little bit soft in heart, you're almost saying her. Um, and the idea of that is really that what he's doing is a kind of mourning in which he's taken the beloved who he's lost into his heart. But again, then gets a little trickier. And this, this is a typical Rossetti sort of move. He, he loves playing with letters themselves. Um, in this one, right? Steep ways and weary without her thou, thou art. And this is the one time her gets a syllable, gets accented, right? As opposed to these other times where it more or less disappears. And what I think is happening, you see the her and the art there, right? If the thou were, they weren't in the middle of it, you'd basically have the word heart. And the thou actually mean, refers to the heart. So basically, he's enacting this broken heart in which the heart breaks itself by having its own self in between it. And it's a kind of, you know, it's a kind of tr literary trick that, you know, he, it's not that Rossetti sort of expects everyone to get, but it, it just sort of builds the kind of tension of loss in this. Um, so as you can see, Rossetti was very obsessed um, in this poem, the and re the repetition sort of helps to uh, explain that, um, or make, se make sense of it, I should say. This next poem is in an artist's studio is by Christina Rossetti, which is um, Dante Gabriel's sister. And he, she wrote this poem about his obsessions. He was a painter as well as a, po a poet. So this is actually a poem she writes in answer to his, um, to a series of poems, including without her. Um, see if I can read it. All right. One face looks out from all his canvases. One self-same figure sits or walks or leans. We found her hidden just behind those screens. That mirror gave back all her loveliness a queen in opal or in ruby dress, a nameless girl in freshest summer greens, a saint, an angel. Every canvas means the same one meaning, neither more nor less. He feeds upon her face by day and night, and she with true kind eyes looks back on him, fair as the moon and joyful as the light. I uh oh, I lost my last line. <laughs> not, not as she is, but as she was. Uh, sorry, not as she is, but was when hope shone bright. Not as she is, but.
but as she fills his dream. Sorry about the timing of that. Uh, I want to get these pictures back up for a second, though. Um, there's a little trick in all these pictures. These are all, in fact, um, Lizzie Siddle. Um, that is his wife, who he painted in all these different things, except for one of them, which I slipped in, um, which is actually someone he began seeing after she died. But you, you couldn't pick out which one she was. Um, they, they look the same. And then the last image, um, which we'll get to in a minute, not as she is, but was when hope shone bright. Not as she is, but as she fills his dream. And I almost always read that wrong, line wrong. I almost always want to say his dreams, which makes more sense to me. But it's singular, dream, um, precisely because he only has one dream, and it's always of her. Um, this, po this last picture um, is of Lizzie in, in, in the, um, as Beatrice. Dante's Beatrice. And so there, she's a, in a dream for Dante. And, but he actually painted this posthumously after her death. Um, so it's also his dream there. And just the way it's lit, I, I, I think, sort of makes it sort of doubly a dream. Um, OK. So here's the poem back without all the clutter of those poems, of, of those, those, those paintings. Um, but I think. The, the, the effect of it is to sort of pile up those images. And I'm just going to point out just a few things about um, this poem. Um, the, again, there's lots to say. that we, um, but And one is the sort of way in which the painter both wants to show and doesn't want to show the beloved. So you get this, we found her hidden behind those screens. So she's, in one sense, hidden away. Um, and yet, the mirror gave back all her loveliness. So she's both hidden away and yet reflected. And there's a kind of ambivalence there. Um, and then the other thing about this is the way the ones of this, right? So she shows up in all these different guises, but always one, one, one. And then there's another typical kind of Rossetti move on this, um, though by a different Rossetti, which this one, O-N, which starts both these lines and then this knot down here, which is actually N-O, which mirror, and we have a mirror in the middle of it that reflects it, right? So O-N and N-O, so you get this kind of neat symmetry between these lines and these lines. Um, similarly, you get a kind of interesting echo, not as she is, but was when hope shone bright. So that's to the past, and then not as she is, but as she fills his dreams, and that seems to be to the present. Um, but in fact, the present itself is, is a kind of past because by this point, he's also gone. Um, just one last aspect of it that I think is really kind of cool is all these rhymes are really exact until you get to the last dream, right? This rhymes, you know, C, D, C, D, C, D, so him, dim, and dream. But of course, you would never say dream. Um, it, it's dream. But there's a way in which the very ending of it just has that little bit of unsettledness that this poem is all about, that the, uh, the way in which obsessiveness is just so, you know, produces both a kind of anxiety and a kind of restlessness. All right. We're going to move forward to the 20th century, um, the 1920s, in fact. Um, this is just a New Yorker cartoon to sort of set the mood a little bit. Um, and then this one. This strikes me as a very sonnety kind of cartoon. He is saying, right, um, huh? Um, um, what, 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 um, what do I mean to you anyway, right? Meaning, love, depth, you know, commitment, all those big words. Um, and she says, oh, just an experience, <laughs> right? She's interested in the situation, he's interested, right? So it's bringing those two parts of the sonnet together here comically. And now we're going to move to a sonnet that seems to me to do a similar kind of thing. This is Edna St. Vincent Millay. Um, I, being born a woman and distressed by all the needs and notions of my kind, am urged by your propinquity to find your person fair and feel a certain zest to bear your body's weight upon my breast. So subtly is the fume of life designed to clarify the pulse and cloud the mind and leave me once again undone, possessed. Think not for this, however, the poor treason of my stout blood against my staggering brain. 
I shall remember you with love or season my scorn with pity. Let me make it plain. I find this frenzy insufficient reason for conversation when we meet again. <laughs> when, I, when, when I teach this poem, um, I usually have my students read their poem, the poems in advance so we can come in ready to discuss. I don't do that with this one. I make them read it for the first time right in class because the guys like fall out of their seat. They go nuts. It's like, you know, because I mean, it's a one night stand poem, right? And, you know, and they're fine with that concept as long as they're the one planning it. Um, and, and so you get to kind of, so th that's the kind of play on this. And of course, it's an extremely playful poem. And I just want to say just a couple quick things about um, what's happening poetically in it, just to, to see how it gets reinforced. Um, first, this word, propinquity, is just a great word. It's just say it out loud, you just, your mouth, it just, um, it's a very, in fact, to me, it's a very zesty word. And I think she's actually playing with the kind of tone of zest and the kind of, the words themselves have that kind of flavor to it. Um, but also, what we get here, you remember we talked a little bit, uh, I guess I've talked, um, <laughs> about how the, the song, we get the four lines, but here, the, 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 the um, idea of the four lines actually spills into the fifth line here, right? As if her um, desire, yeah, that's a good word, as if her desire just is sort of excessive. And, you know, your person fair and feel a certain zest. You could have ended it there, but to bear your body's weight upon my breast. It's just uh, that much more. Um, which then gives her only three lines to sort of solve the rest of the thing. And so then she, has, she does this really nice thing about sort of, this is a poem about balance. Um, and she, she's out of balance at the moment, um, right? Feeling too much. And so, but here, to clarify the pulse and cloud the mind. And that line balances really nicely. Um, but then the next line, and leave me once again undone, possessed. And you can hear in the rhythm of it that sort of possessed is also excessive. It's like just a little too much. Um, and then you get a little break in which she gains control again. And that's where we get back to this. And uh, just a couple of just last things about this, right? So, think not for this, however, the poor treason of my stout blood against my staggering brain. And I love the way stout blood is these sort of, it's, it's what's called a spondy, two accented words in a row that are just like really clear, solid, you know, as opposed to staggering brain. And if you say that right, you can kind of get the staggering sound in staggering brain. I, I can't quite pull it off, you need one, an actor for it, but. Um, and so again, you get this sort of comparison and balance between these two, which you might notice are alliterative, right? The st of staggering and of stout and the B of blood and brain. So they balance really nicely, even though they're unbalanced. Um, and then just as propinquity here had a certain zest to it, right? Here I really like, let me make it plain. Um, and then the language really drops to very plain language, right? When we meet again, that, that could be just prose. Um, but then also this, I find this frenzy insufficient reason. Well, naturally, since frenzy is the opposite of reason, she's going to find it insufficient. So there's that kind of balance there. Um, anyway, what I like about ending with this poem is, you know, partly there's no real death in it, so it's kind of nice to get out of that for a moment. <laughs> um, but, and it's not clear whether there's love in it or not. I'll, I'll leave that to individuals to decide. But the way in which this poem takes on the same kind of techniques we were looking at before, but to create a very different kind of tone um, and a very different kind of sort of imagination, uh, more modern sensibility, we might say. Um, uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay, probably when she wrote this poem or a little bit afterwards, probably the most popular poet in, in America at the time. Um, so, thank you.
a real eye-opener to have a, a kind of lesson in poetry reading from a, a brilliant professor. <laughs> um, I've never had one before, so <laughs> exciting. Um, I suppose, you know, the, the question that's on my mind is um, whether, uh, I mean, poetry is, you know, for, for most of us, most of the time, a kind of arcane uh, form that, that, you know, we can often, like, go without reading poems for um, days. <laughs> <laughs> Weeks and hours. Uh, or months. Um, so I, I suppose I'm wondering whether um, there, uh, you know, I, I mentioned Bob Dylan, you know, way back when, uh, and, you know, he, he was, I guess, the, apart from, you know, all the classic poets that I was reading as a boy, he was the one that really got into the public consciousness and really did move people. Um, but I'm wondering if, if you think that, you know, is poetry just a sort of um, a specialist, uh, arcane, narrow interest for academics and, the, and their, the students they teach? Or does it really have a, a public um, role and significance today? Um, well, let me go back to Bob Dylan. Is this, am I hearable from here? Yeah. yeah. Um, let me go back to Bob Dylan. Um, not too long ago, um, a, a bunch of poets who actually went over to the recently just become again the Russia um, after the fall of the Soviet Union. And actually Dylan was among the poets who toured with them. Um, so I think that's a kind of interesting thing that he clearly um, you know, wants to be associated with poets. Um, and I mean, to me, I mean, what I like about the Malay poem, right, is it's taking on a kind of immediate issue about that, their human condition. Um, if one thinks of Wordsworth, who with some reluctance, I, I didn't manage to talk about any of the Wordsworth poems. Um, Wordsworth wrote over 500 sonnets. Um, and many of them are very political and efforts to really engage the world. And there's not, um, you know, when I'm looking at these poems and sort of saying, you know, notice this word and how it does this little thing, you actually can get a lot out of these poems without noticing any of that, <laughs> right? That is, that gives a certain layer of pleasure to it. But at the same time, that's in a lot of ways what sort of helps create an almost subconscious drive to the poem, that the rest of us, we can register just in how we read it, if we read it the way we breathe. Um, so, you, you know, so in that sense, I, I think the accessibility of poetry Ought to, needs to be emphasized more. Um, but also, I think um, there are a lot of poets who really want to communicate in the same way TV writers, you know, um, want to communicate, um, and all forms of artists do. I mean, you constantly will hear, if Shakespeare, you know, were alive today, he, he'd be writing sitcoms. Um, I don't think so. I don't think his comedies are very good. I, th I, I think he'd be writing the dramas. Um, but the point is that all these forms um, have value in terms of communication, but the neat thing about something like poetry is it has value in part because it has this long tradition behind it. When a poet writes today a sonnet, they can hear the echoes of those other sonnets before them. Um, I don't know, you, there probably aren't any 90210 fans left, right, other than me? Um, okay, so uh, the, the first time, um, the cool kid shows up. Um, he has a book of Byron in his hand. Um, and there's a little bit of Byron <laughs> quoted there. And once you start sort of watching that, how often poetry shows up in, on television, you start realizing it does have a second life in that way. Um, but I would encourage us to remember it has a first life too in the page <laughs> and in reading. So. I think it's time we open the um, questioning to the, to the floor. See if you can get any. Maybe if you want to read a, a sonnet, you know, uh, spontaneous. <laughs> that I have one here I didn't get to. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm wondering what your feeling is about the lack of uh, rhyming and, in some sense, the lack of meter that uh, modern poets seem to feel is appropriate. I, um, I happen to read some poetry uh, in the book, and I couldn't find a single rhyme, or uh, the meter was very 
very much eat also. And yet, uh, that seems to be um, <coughs> the most used <coughs> form now. They, they don't rhyme, they don't, they don't seem to have much meter, and yet they are considered to be poets, poems. So the question is, is, it, about is about whether we can have, uh, why, why, the, why does contemporary poetry not use rhyme the way uh, the sonnet does? Yeah. yeah, and I will say, I mean, there have been a lot of poets who have been experimenting actually with unrhymed sonnets. Um, and what, um, I mean, I'm perfectly comfortable with unrhymed um, and um, sort of open meter poems. I, I think, um, Poetry can be written in all kinds of different ways. Um, but usually when you look at those poems, they'll never, the key to them is realizing they're never indifferent to sound, even if they're going to not rhyme explicitly. There's going to be curious echoes, near rhymes, echoes of the consonants that are far enough apart that you, it doesn't feel alliterative. Um, the meter will be not quite iambic, but just enough of it to, to create a kind of drive. Um, you know, but of course there are other ways of thinking about poetry. One can think about poetry um, you know, as, as something visual on the page. Right? So you can get a, a, a poem that just sort of sprawls down the page this way, and it's that visual effect of falling that the poet is after, and not the kind of tightness of rhyme. Um, and I think it's great that poets experiment in different ways. Um, most of those poets who write unrhymed poetry also do rhyme. Um, and then it's interesting, you know, the sort of great um, English epics anyway uh, in verse, in poetry, don't rhyme. That is, the prelude, um, Paradise Lost, they're written in meter, but they're, they use sound in different ways, but not rhyme. So. Okay, thank you. There's a lady over here. Oh. Do you also teach Edmund Spencer? And if you do, do you teach that wedding hymn, six column wedding hymn, where he says, Gosh, look at that woman I'm going to marry. Look at her dress and look at those flowers in her hair. Have you ever seen anything so pretty? And if you, if you do teach it, is it still the most popular written love hymn? I don't think that was his accent. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the Spencer's epithalamian. Um, um, I don't teach it. Um, what, what, what I teach of Spencer's when I get to teach him is from the Fairy Queen. Um, and partly because the romantics the, who I work on draw off the Fairy Queen so much. Um, you know, I think it's a lot more appropriate as poems go for a wedding than let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Um, <laughs> But I don't know what its popularity is these days. And I'll have to think whether I should teach it um, when I get a chance to teach poetry again. Thanks. Yes, there's a lady in the middle. I like Do very speak up. To hear you. I like very much to hear you recite something you too have written. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't bring anything with me. <laughs> Um, um, I'm laughing because the only poem I know of mine by heart needs to be sung and I can't sing. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Okay, another lady over here, and then lady over there. Uh, and, well, let, let's start off with a mic over, over there and then come back to this lady in the middle. Um, hi. I Hi. thank you for your talk. It was wonderful. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, and I was thinking about how long poems seem to last in the imagination, which is a long, long time. Uh, whether it's you know kind of the cultural imagination that gets passed down or in an individual's mind. And I wondered how to explain that. Um, and I thought about, you know, there are different things. They're so compact and they're so pretty very often. So very often, as you showed, they're clever. But I think mostly I remember poems that, had, that expressed something that I want expressed. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's why they last. 
Yeah, um, you know, Pope's description of poetry was um, thoughts often thought but ne'er so well expressed, and that that's what a poem does. So, so none of the ideas of a poem are necessarily unique. In fact, part of their power is that we think something like that too, and that the poem gives a sense of clarity to it. Um, and so I, but I think the reason individuals often, it can often stay with them so long, is with a poem, if you remember, it's a, a bit like a song, right? It, it, if you get a single word of it, the, the next couple words will come tripping along to you. And that can, you know, so although I don't know, you know, I've never set out to memorize um, when I have fears, I could probably just say it right now. Um, you know, so I think, and, and, I, and I think part of that too is the repetition and the meter and the, the rhyme are all things that help with memory for that. Um, in terms of why cultures hang on to it, that's another interesting question, and I think a lot of that has to do with the way in which poems get deployed in different places at important moments in history. Um, Thanks, another question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you think, uh, do you see in your students uh, sort of a renewed interest in this as we've got blogs and things, and I'm thinking about maybe for the last 20 or so years, people that have been creative and maybe would have lent themselves toward doing science and other types of poetry than doing songwriting and, and those kinds of things. And now that people can get their own stuff published on their own websites and blogs and things, does this offer a new opportunity for a re-explosion of this kind of writing? Well, I think it definitely offers a new opportunity. Um, my students have always been interested, you know, at Vanderbilt in reading and writing poetry. Now, of course, that's partly self-fulfilling. They won't take my class if they're not. Um, but, um, but, but th that tradition of songwriting and the tradition of poetry are entwined traditions, and particularly here in Nashville, I suppose. Um, but I do think the blogs, two things happen there is people find poems that they like. So in fact, where I, you know, you know, when I want to look at, look at a poem, I rarely go to a book anymore. I just Google it and get the poem to come up. Um, and very often it'll come up on someone's blog, which of course means I need to check to make sure they got the punctuation right and all of that. But, you know, different people have a chance to comment on it. And it's interesting how often someone will comment by sort of writing an answering poem to it. So I do think there's a kind of way in which that's a space for that kind of exploration. Um, it's, it's also a way to kind of make it okay for someone to be a poet without you know, being able to make it into the New Yorker or being able to, make, you know, to publish a volume, which is a very expensive enterprise for a press to take on a volume of poetry. So. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Was there um, one lady in the middle there, and then our last question here. I'm going to play devil's advocate. Okay. Do you pick out things, do you really think that the writer of the poetry has all of those things in mind? Or is it just successful because we can see those things now and that's what makes it good? Yeah, th that's a great question actually. And you know, when I've fielded a number of times in my class, um, one of the analogies I use for that um, is if you play chess and you play chess a little bit the way I do, you can see two or three moves in advance. Um, but a grandmaster of it is seeing 10, in some cases, 15, 20 moves in advance. So there's a kind of depth that these poets who really work on these poems get. Um, but it also works another way. I mean, poets have to be alert to accidents of sound, right? So they may write in their first draft, you know, so the, all those hers we saw there, right? One could imagine in a first draft, I just sort of wrote it and didn't really think about it. But when he goes back through in the revision, he's then both a writer and a reader, right? So he starts noticing things about his own poetry. And that particular one, it, I'm absolutely certain he noticed. Now, sometimes I go out on a limb. Um, and occasionally in print, I get in a little bit of trouble for going out on a limb. Um, but so, for example, the, the argument I was making about the her 
thou art, that's when if you said, oh, come on, I, I just have to say, isn't it a better poem if you think that's there? <laughs> you know, and I, I mean, I can't fully defend that one. Whereas, but the theme that comes out of noticing that, that this is about a broken heart, and that her is what needs to be sort of put into the heart, that's clear, and there's in sort of enough evidence that it's clear that that's sort of behind that poet's intention. Um, there are other more complicated answers, such as, I don't really care about the poet's intention. I, I care about what I can do with the poem as a reader. And that's a very legitimate way of approaching a poem, too. Um, but not, not the only way. OK, last question here at the front. <coughs> I'm afraid, sorry, we're running out of time. This is a comment. I hope you never go into administration because I know you'd be a good one, but I'd hate to see your world of fun to have you as a teacher. Thank you. <laughs> can, can, can I get that in writing for my dean? <laughs> okay, one, one last, last, last question. I'm just getting too many, too much well, response here. I want to know, is the Song of Solomon too erotic for young college male and female in the classroom for today? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, 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 <laughs> time we thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.